Welcome to Mom Autism Money Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking with Kara Harvey. Kara is the author of the 15-Minute Formula, How Busy Mom Can Ditch the Overwhelm, Say Yes to What Actually Matters, and Conquer Their Goals. And she is going to be chatting with us about time management, goals. And I would like to also mention that Kara is also a former autistic support teacher. So she is going to break this down so we can understand. (laughs) No, definitely, definitely. This is an episode I feel like I am particularly in need of right now because during this pandemic, I feel like I used to have time management down. And when we talk to her today, you'll just see her go through some things that really address what we're all going through right now. And so I'm excited to apply this to my own life. She makes a bunch of IEP analogies and stuff. So yeah, this is definitely a really cool episode for us as parents of autistic kids. So Kara is a wife and a mom to a 15-year-old stepson, six-year-old daughter, and four-year-old son. She works as a productivity coach, and her mission is to help busy moms take massive action on their goals and triple their productivity without overwhelm or burnout. She does this via her blog and podcast, The Purpose Driven Mom. She also has virtual community groups, e-courses that help women learn to prioritize their life. And starting in January, she'll be completing her mission through her book, The 15-Minute Formula. All right, guys, let's talk to Kara. All right. Hi, everyone. We are here today with Kara Harvey of A Purpose Driven Mom. And Kara has a book coming out called The 15 Minute Formula. So we're going to be talking today a little bit about time management. You might be sitting here thinking, hey, we're on a money podcast. Why are we talking about time? There is that old adage that time is money. And that is true right? But another thing that we've got going on is moms with kids on the spectrum is just that our time is very, especially during the pandemic, very difficult to manage. And so even when we're talking about managing things like our finances or just our day-to-day lives, finding the time to actually address all of this paperwork, all of this additional stuff that we have to do, it can be a challenge. So we're really excited to have Kara here with us today. And Kara, I'm wondering off the top, you have a background in education, specifically working with disabled kids. And I'm wondering if you can tell us just a little bit more about that and how how that background kind of informs the work you do today. Sure. Yeah. And thanks for having me. I actually found that a lot of the stuff I did when I was a special education teacher, I use in my practice, someone on another interview, they said, well, where did all your frameworks come from? And I I did some thinking about it and I realized how much of it came from that degree. So I will tell you, I'm still paying off those loans. So I'm very excited that I get to use them (laughs) to help um, with what I'm doing now. But yeah, I was a special education teacher for eight years and I taught every grade, but six, I think. So I was all over the place and I did a variety of things, um, including I taught one class that was for kids on the autistic spectrum. The school I worked at was a charter school and we didn't have a lot of kids at it, a couple hundred. It was brand new. And we were, the phrase they used was building the ship as, you know, as we're sailing type of a thing. And at one point we had more and more students with IEPs coming into the school and they really didn't know what to do. I don't know uh, your experience with charter schools, but they, they just don't know what to do a lot of times when it comes to IEPs. And I had brought a background from working in the public school system. I felt like I had a good handle on it. And I said, listen, these kids need supports. What do you think if I like put a program together? And they were like, sure. And so I wound up teaching a class um, that was really a mix of like life skills and functional skills where, you know, we ran the school store and we taught money management. We did a sewing unit, laundry, cooking, um, and it was for students with emotional behavioral disabilities and kids on the autistic spectrum, just to give them that boost. And on top of that, I did a ton of learning support, push in and pull out. I feel like I've literally been in almost every role you could be in as a special education teacher. And like I said, the really cool thing about, especially working so much with kids with behavioral um, challenges, I did that in my student teaching. I did that in other grades was that I felt like I had a really good grasp on how I could help kids make behavioral changes, have a really good FBA, like all those things together, and then take that and I say, how can we take this and flip this on its head a little bit for moms to make essentially like their own progress monitoring charts and system for themselves? Because honestly, like if special education in my mind is done right, it's just a lot of best practices, right? It's a lot of individualizing what people need. And I thought, all right, light bulb, let's take this and turn this into something that everybody can use and customize and make their own individualized like action plans for their goals. 
And now you also have this online empire called the Purpose Driven Mom. And it's just, it's super impressive, super uplifting. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that and how it kind of came to be. Sure. I mean, like I said, I was a teacher for so long and I am one of those people who I am an accidental entrepreneur. Like I did not mean to be sitting in this seat right now talking about a book on a podcast. I thought I was going to be a teacher since I was seven years old. I used to play school with my sisters. It was something I knew I wanted to do. And I loved teaching. I still love teaching and I still itch a little bit to like get back in the classroom. My husband is a school principal. And so he always is telling me his stories, um, especially at his school. He's like, oh, they're messing up the IEPs and stuff. And I'm like, oh, let me get in there. <laughs> like, let me get in there and do Like I just, I love working with kids, but right around year seven, I hit burnout. I was exhausted. I wasn't really taking care of myself. I was at school. Like I mentioned the charter school I went, I was at kids went to school from eight to five and every other Saturday from nine to 12. So I was there like 6 AM to 7 PM. I ran a lot of our student programs. I was a ninth grade lead. It was just it was a lot and I was losing myself along the way. In my own personal life, I've struggled with depression. I've struggled with anxiety and I could feel all of these things creeping up that I was kind of just like withering away inside. I would cry a lot. And I remember my breaking point was I was on an admin track and I was the principal of our summer school program. And the last day of summer school overlapped with the first day of regular school for teachers. And I sat in my car and I cried because I was like, I can't be in both places. I don't know how to do it anymore. I came home that day and I said to my husband, like, I got to do something else. And he's a numbers guy. And he was like, cool, whatever you want to do, I'll support it. We need to pay these bills. So what are you thinking? At the time, I had been dabbling in network marketing. Like I was paying for a product or whatever. And I thought, all right, what if I, and I hate this word hustle, but I'm going to use it because I nuts what I did. What if I hustle? Like, what if I bust my behind and I see if I can make not what I'm making teaching, but that bare minimum to just leave? Because I knew at this point, my mental health was suffering. And if I didn't like make a change at this point, I was going to go back to having like severe depressive episodes and it wasn't good. So that year I did it. I I mean, I did not sleep. I really don't know how I did it. I don't recommend it. Don't do what I did. Now that I know what I know, like I don't recommend it at all, but it's what I did. And then I left at the end of year eight, went full-time into network marketing. And I did that successfully for a few years, I'd say two to three years. And on the outside, it looked amazing. I mean, people were like, how are you doing this? You have 250 people on your team. You'd grown this six-figure network marketing business. But in my head, I was suffering and I was drowning because I was doing all the same things that had burnt me out when I was teaching. And I brought that into my business. I equated burnout with success. If I was the last one to stay at school, well, then I was the best teacher. I was the hardest worker. And, you know, like I can admit these things now. I, you know, I'm embarrassed that I thought them at the time, but these were the belief systems I held on to. Like if I worked harder than everyone else, that meant that I would be better. And um, I've learned that is not the truth. And it was burning me out in network marketing. And so what I started to do was kind of back away from that business a little bit because it just wasn't sustainable. I was glued to my telephone. I wouldn't go to bed until I was at like inbox zero every night. I had hundreds of Facebook messages coming in that I was trying to keep up with. And I would jump as soon as somebody would message me. I'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, I don't care if we're at dinner with my family. Like, let me help you because I was so fearful that I would lose a sale or I wouldn't be successful. And I had started to kind of like feel that fade again that I had felt in teaching. And right when I was almost like fully popped with my son who is now four years old. So it was like August and he was born in September. I said to my husband, I think I need to change. I think something has to give. And I said, I I think I might back up the network marketing stuff and do something different. I'd felt um, for me, God, like pulling me to do something different. I'd always been like a more um, organized person. I'd managed a lot of schedules. I knew how to do it. And people were asking for help in that area all the time. So I thought, okay, let me back up on this what do you think if I start this business? And I like stop the network marketing thing, just like let the residual income come in. And I try this. And he was like, yeah, sure. Like we make enough money. Like we'll be fine. And then a week later he lost his job. He was out of work then for eight months after that. And I had my son two weeks after he lost his job. And so in the, that period of eight months, it was absolutely wild. Um, we almost lost everything. We were on government assistance and food stamps, and we almost had to file for bankruptcy. We actually paid a bankruptcy lawyer a deposit, but we couldn't afford to pay the full fee. So we never went through with it, which I'm thankful. Like we never like went through with it because after he finally was employed again and my business started taking off. We've, we've been able to like thrive now with my business, but it was a really wild road because here I am postpartum. I had postpartum anxiety, depression, and rage. So I was dealing with all these hormones. My husband is out of work. We've almost lost everything. And here I am trying to grow a business. And so in the midst of all of that, I got a job, a part-time job uh, at the bookstore. We were really just kind of like passing ships for a bit. 
And then in 2020, things actually took a turn positively for my business because moms were home. They needed help with routines. And I had been consistent with what I was doing that I happened to be there when they were like, help me. Uh, And since then, honestly, everything's kind of blown up for a purpose driven mom where it has become, you said this empire, which is such a fun word. It feels like that now. It, It feels like this really cool business, you know, that I have going, I have the book coming out and it's wild because I never thought that I would be here. That is incredible. Thank you for being so open and honest about that journey, because I I feel like a lot of times we focus on the successes or, or promoting like, oh, I did this and you can do it too. And for me, when I was building my business, it was a lot of the same thing. Like it was a lot of work while I was living below the poverty line, just keeping consistent, you know? And then after doing that for a while, after providing that consistency, the rewards really came later. I'm just so happy for you that everything panned out the way that it did. I do want to talk a little bit about your upcoming book, The 15 Minute Formula. Can you just give us like a general overview of the book and how it can help parents with their time management? You know, a lot of people, they like want to write a book forever. It's like on their list. Uh, I never thought I was going to write a book. I joke because I actually used to be like, oh, I'm not one of those bloggers who wants a book. Like I was like, I want a TED talk. Like I I can't write. And I had all these beliefs that I wasn't equipped to write a book. And I thought like, what would I write about? I'm not that good at it. It wasn't on my list. And then right around February of last of this year, 2021, I was searching for books for our book club in the Purpose Driven Mom Club, which is my membership. And we do a book club every month. And it was really hard for me to find productivity books for moms. Like if you Google, if you search like time management books for moms, there, there isn't a lot out there. Now there's tons on productivity. There's tons on time management, but a lot of it's geared towards like business owners or like a little bit more of that, like hustle mentality. And as moms, I find that our time it's different. And nobody was really talking about it. I felt like a lot of the messages that were coming in the time management and productivity space were all very shame-based. And I will admit, I used to say a lot of the phrases that have now, I, like they grind my gears. I'm like, no, no, no. Like we let's talk about it differently because I had that same belief system in my head, but all of those phrases, like your why needs to be bigger than your excuses. And, you know, we have the same 24 hours in a day. I used to say them all the time. And now I realize how damaging that was. And so after researching. I couldn't find anything. I thought, all right, I think, I think if this is it, maybe if this is what the plan is, I'm going to do this. Right. So I was like praying about it. I was like, listen, God, if this is what you want me to do, I'm gonna do it. And I got an email two days later from one of my like virtual online mentors with the subject line that said, I want to help you write your book. And I was like, what, what? I literally could not believe it. And it was an in-person workshop, but only like 10 people because of COVID could come. It was literally the town my sister lives in and the dates that that had been picked for the workshop. I had already planned to take two days off because it was right after my summit. And I knew I needed to relax. And I was like, this is wild. Like I have to go. So I just went. And in April, I came out of that workshop with just a renewed energy to help moms empower themselves to manage their time in a way that's not hustle. That's not shame-based. That's not one size fits all, but in a way that actually aligns with what's important to them in their season. And that's really what the 15 minute formula is about. It is about creating a seasonal productivity system in your life that allows you to say yes to what matters, not what you see on Instagram, not what you think you're supposed to be doing, not the guilt trips of all the things, especially now, right? The holidays, like all the things you think you're supposed to do, but say what matters now, And then how can I create an action plan around that? That isn't going to add five hours to my day, right? You'll see these people like, great. When you have a free Saturday, like take three hours down in your basement to declutter. Like nobody is doing that, right? Like we don't have that time in the book. We talk about how you can make an action plan that you can fit into what I call your power pockets of your day. That as a busy mom, when your kid gets sick or, you know, the dog throws up and your whole day gets thrown off, how you can stay the course without feeling super off track without feeling like you're failing and how you can end the day instead just of throwing your hands up in the air and feeling like you're failing with tiny pockets in your day that you've done for you towards your goals and really working on progress. I like that. (laughs) Brain and I are, so we always joke that um, our to-do list or our daily to-do list is empty, not like filled up because we don't know what's going to happen. Um, and like you said, I also I always used to feel guilty because, you know, I didn't have my planner filled. So could you speak a little bit about how can we manage for the unknown? And I kind of feel guilty because sometimes I can't make plans because I don't know what's going to happen in the future. So what will ha- what do you suggest we do? Like, like what do you say to especially parents because we don't have that luxury of having our calendars full during the day or to do list max. 
but we have like a little, we live like wiggle, wiggle room in our, in our day. So mm-hmm. and we always tend to feel guilty about that because like you said, we have to be busy to be good mothers or time managed. Like what would you say to parents like us that don't have our calendars filled up, can't answer your question, like what are you doing Tuesday, you know, at 1130? Well, first, I think that one of the biggest mistakes I notice with moms that I work at is that they try to put too much into their calendar anyway. And then when something happens, they get thrown off. They don't know what to do. So they do, we call it the Monday mentality, that thing where you're like, well, I'll try it again on Monday. And they stay like, screw it for the rest of the week. So I know when you have an unpredictable schedule, it can feel really hard to plan anything. I find that moms come to me with either too tight of a schedule because they're jamming everything in or too um, open of a schedule because they just don't even know how to handle the unknown. And so a couple of recommendations that I would give is to start super small, especially if you're not doing anything for yourself. I think it's really important. There's three things that I suggest um, in my weekly planning system that moms add into their day, 15 minutes or less or more, but at least I think 15 is kind of a nice magic number. And I didn't say this in, in the before, but the reason I named the 15 minute formula is because what I have found is 15 minutes is a magic space where I can get a little bit of something done that will progress me towards my goals. It isn't everything, right? But it feels good to do something. But 15 minutes, I can scroll TikTok for 15. I can scroll TikTok for an hour, right? Like that goes fast. That goes so incredibly fast, but I can convince myself to do anything for 15 minutes. So my suggestion is if this is where you're starting and you're like, I have this open calendar because I know that I might have to grab this last minute appointment, right? Because sometimes when you have, especially if you have like specialist doctors, for example, like my daughter has epilepsy. And sometimes if we can just get into her neurologist, like I'm gonna take it. Like I don't even, we're gonna take it and we're gonna move everything else around. So if you have a schedule like that, then it might feel hard to put anything in, but I'm gonna say 15, 15 minutes on one of your goals. This could be, I'm gonna go for a 15 minute walk. This could be, I'm gonna declutter for 15 minutes. This could be, I'm gonna, you know, watch this course or something like that. 15 minutes for also a habit or a routine. So this isn't like, I'm gonna create this nine step morning routine, right? The, this is the other thing. When you said the 5 a.m., I'm like, oh goodness, that's another thing that drives me crazy. Like we don't have to wake up at 5 a.m. to be the most productive, but doesn't society make us feel like if we don't, we're failing, we're behind, like we're not doing the right thing. So instead of that, can you do one or two things in a tiny routine. And then the last 15 minutes for your own personal growth and some learning, reading a book, listening to a podcast, taking a course. I find that that helps grow confidence. When you start small, you might, your brain might be like, oh, that's not enough because we're conditioned to feel like we have to go in or, you know, go big or go home. Right. But I'm going to tr- encourage you small 15 minute steps towards just one goal. You're going to start to gain confidence that you might've lost that tells you I can show up for me, deserve to show up for me. I can find the time in my busy, unpredictable day for me. It might not be three hours, but it's 15 minutes. And that is very important. The other thing I'm going to recommend though, when you're planning these things out, um, and I have a whole like system for like how to break down what to do, but if you're planning them out, don't plan to do things seven days a week. I know there's, you know, consistency, 21 days, habit, all that, but I'm telling you, you need buffer time. So when people say to me like, okay, I want to work on my evening routine. I'm going to load the dishwasher seven days a week. I tell them, bring it back to six or five. Give yourself one buffer day for life to happen and you not be able to do it. Then that way you're not like, I'm a failure. You're not panicked. You're not trying to find time for it. You're like, I got the five days in. I have two days of a buffer in case life happens because we know it will. And if I do those, those are bonuses. It releases a lot of pressure and stress when you're not trying to do everything perfectly. And I believe that, yes, would it take you a little bit longer to maybe create a consistent habit than 21 days or whatever the studies say? Yeah, maybe. But I think that trying to do everything for seven days in a row, you're not going to do it. Like, I'm not a pessimist, but I'm a realist with three kids. And I know that I'm not going to do anything, everything every day. So why not create myself a buffer space so that when I don't do it, I'm not shaming myself. I'm not berating myself. I'm not like, see, and this is what my voice sounds like. Um, I have this concept called the inner critic and, and I encourage you to give yours a name. Mine is Julia. And whenever Julia is starting to act foolish in my head, like I know I'm like, Julia, we're not doing this today. Right. But Julia, well, she, she's rude. She'll be like, you're such a loser. You said you were going to get your house together. You're never going to be able to get it together. Look, you didn't load the dishes again. Don't you care about this? Isn't this important? Right. And so when she starts talking all this nonsense in my head, I know 
that I can tell her, you know what, Julia, I told myself I was going to do it five days. Today's just my off day. And it releases that bit of guilt that I have of showing up perfectly. So I think if you have an unpredictable schedule, you can still carve out a little bit of time. I don't want you to throw your hands in the air and say, oh, well, I can't do everything. That all or nothing mentality has, has kind of seeped in that makes us feel like if we don't show up perfectly, it doesn't matter. But progress is showing up. And progress is better than perfection. Intention is the goal, not the perfection here. I feel like you're talking specifically to me. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like oh my gosh, like I berate myself. I'm very type A. And so especially these past couple of years, I feel like if I'm not 100% on top of my stuff, I'm just failing. And it's, it's not like I want to throw my hands up in the air, but I do. I get discouraged. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just so important to remember is that that motivation comes from just even if you can't get it all done, just making that, that meaningful progress, like that 15 minute time slot seems like just such a, such a great idea and such a great way to keep your motivation up. And now a word from our sponsor. If you have a child who wanders at night, you probably wish there was a bed enclosure that could keep them safe so everyone can sleep. Good news. Another autism mom has already been there and created it for you. Rose Morris of Abrams Nation created the safety sleeper for her own son, Abram. At just two years old, his sole goal was to get outside. She lived in constant terror that he'd succeed and neither of them ever slept. But his safety sleeper became his refuge. He slept and she didn't worry anymore. It changed their lives. The safety sleeper zips around a standard mattress. Some people say it looks like a tent. A metal frame, padding, canvas, fabric, and zippers make it sturdy and comfortable. If sleep and nighttime security are an issue you face, the Safety Sleeper is likely to change your life too. Log on to safetysleeper.com backslash M-A-M. That M-A-M, it's short for Mom Autism Money. That's safetysleeper.com backslash M-A-M for more information. Some of us are still doing cyber school. I hope that that's over soon. But especially as parents of autistic kids, we've been pretty much performing the job of paraprofessionals for sure. Sometimes even therapists. And I mean, honestly, sometimes even the teachers like that responsibility has fallen on us. And I feel like a lot of my time, I've just by no choice of my own, I feel like I've just lost it. I'm wondering, this is kind of a tricky question, a heavy question. and. I'm just wondering if you have any tips for time management when your kids have been home like 24 seven for going on two years now. Yeah. Oh yeah. This could be a whole episode. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you some top ones that we can kind of chat through because I have been there. Like I've been trying to work from home when like I had both my kids home one part-time, one full-time during the pandemic. Now they're at school. So like I've been there. And so um, I want to just encourage everybody listening if that's you. And, and here's the thing too, like my daughter's homesick today, right? Like two weeks ago, my son's class was quarantined. Like it still happens even if you're not full-time, like even if the school's not closed or, you know what I mean, for in-person. So I think there's been so much weight on the on our shoulders and a lot of it lands on, on us as moms that I want to just like encourage everybody now to like take a deep breath and realize you're doing the best you can and you are doing an amazing job. What has been put on our shoulders the past two years is heavy, it's mentally taxing, it's physically taxing. And when you're home, and especially like I work from home, so like my home leads into my work life and you don't leave the house and you're like very on demand, especially for parents of kids who are on the spectrum or that's demanding. And so I wanna like virtually hug people for the podcast because it's hard and I know that you're doing the best that you can. Practically, I'm gonna give you a couple of things that have helped me and some of them I'm doing today with my daughter home, trying to manage the things. One of the things that helps for me is theming out the schooling. Now, this is very different if your kid has, like my oldest is in ninth grade. So he, when he was home, he had to be at a certain class at a certain time. Some of, some people are homeschooling, right? So they, they can make their own schedule. So you'll have to kind of customize this, but creating themes for different blocks in your day allows me to alleviate some of the guilt of feeling like I have to do everything at once. You ever do that where you have to like sit down to work, but then you see the dishes and you're like, oh, now I got to go to the dishes. Oh, the laundry's got to go in the dryer. And then you don't get work done. Or you like haul away and do work all day long because you're trying to catch up and then your, your home stuff is, is kind of, uh, you know, floundering. So I love time blocking. It's my very favorite way to schedule. I used to be like married to an hourly scheduler. Like I would marry my planner. Like I loved it so much. But when I was in the classroom, 
I had to be. It made sense for me, right? Like I was doing some periods, I was doing push-in support to two classes. Like I had to be in two classes during one period and rotate and IP means all that. And so when I left teaching and I started to make my own schedule, I took all that same stuff here. And it worked a little bit, but again, like I mentioned at the beginning, I was burning out in network marketing because I was still trying to do the same thing. And it didn't click for me until my kid, my daughter was born. My stepson, he is 15. He's with us every other week. So our schedule was a little different, but when my daughter was born and it was like full time with me, I realized she does not care about my schedule. I was like, don't you know that I have planned out this beautiful schedule in my planner and I hate crossing things off. Like she did not care. And I learned that kids are unpredictable. And it like was this light bulb moment for me where I was trying to have too much control over the schedule and it was causing resentment frustration, temper tantrums, like all those things. Now I love routines and rhythms. I think we need them. And I think our kids thrive off them, but I do not believe that a routine and a schedule needs to be minute by minute planned out. I think that goes back to what I was saying about the buffer time, right? Like by having it so tightly, like when you jam everything in your dresser drawer type of like planner, you're setting yourself up for failure. So instead I suggest moving to time blocks if you can. And these are literally just anchored blocks that are, I would say, three to five hours of your day. And I typically anchor mine around events in my day. So this could be like dropping my, my kid off at school, coming home for lunch. If you're home cyber schooling, this could be when the school day starts to when they get their break for lunch, you know, or whatever their schedule looks like. I make these blocks so that I can kind of theme in my head what's going to be happening. So if you know, for example, that from nine to 12 is when, you know, your kid, and again, this is going to vary depending on age and how much supports they need, but thinking about that from nine to 12, you're like, I need to be with them. They're doing their cyber schooling. I need to be there to give supports. Like that's it. Mentally wrapping your head around the time that like that theme for that block is school. I think will help you alleviate some of the guilt of feeling like you have to jam everything else in. Well, if they're doing school, maybe I could still squeeze this in. And maybe you can, but I would say, have that be the theme. Look through your calendar and then say, can I have another block that has a theme that's like, literally like my goals or my work. I have one block, we call it mommy time. And that's when my kids come home from school till dinner. And during mommy time, like I'm just mom, like we do activities, we have dinner together, we play. I'm not worrying about work. And I don't feel super guilty about the dishes in the sink or the work that has to get done because I know that I have a block that um, at the end of the day, after they go to bed, that's my like um, close up block. So that's when I do my dishes and I do all the cleaning stuff. And I worry about that later. And I think that If you can look at your schedule and theme out blocks in a way that helps you wrap your head and compartmentalize a little bit, that's amazing. Now, let's be a little bit more realistic. You can't always compartmentalize because things are going to change. And so knowing that that's the main theme, but giving yourself the grace and the freedom to say like, but if they're working independently on something and they don't need me for 15 minutes, I don't have to sit and stare at them. What else can I do? And I can go do the dishes. And so one last recommendation I'll give on this, because like I said, this is a whole topic uh, in itself is I always have a list of things I can do with my kids around available. Um, I call it the microwave minute checklist. And it's literally things that I can do in 15 minutes or less that if I have to stop and like go take somebody to the potty or open up a Play-Doh or break up a fight or whatever we're doing, I can stop and I won't be super annoyed. So when this is like my personal stuff, this is like unloading the dishes. I can do that with my kids around or sweeping up the floor or changing and folding the laundry. So if my kids are little, my small ones are like independently playing, I'm not standing there trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. I can be like, oh, let me go to my, and I literally keep this list on my fridge because I will forget because, you know, mom brain. And I'm like, oh, what's something on my list I can do right now? Oh, good, you're right. Let me go fold that load of laundry real quick while they're independent playing. And these are all tasks that I know will take me 15 minutes or less. So again, if I'm interrupted, I could do it or if I have the pocket. I also have a list like this for work. So for example, today, my daughter's home sick. I still need to get some work done. I have made a list this morning and it was all the things I had to do that were absolutely urgent for the day broken down into 15 minute chunks because some of them would take maybe 40 minutes, but I was like, let me break these down into like very small chunks for work. And I said, all right, so when I have time in between like her being sick or whatever, I can do this. So before we got on this, I was sitting out there with her. I had my list of 15 minute tasks and I was able to do four of them. Now the four tasks took me two hours, not one hour, like the math should say, because in the midst of those two hours, she was like, mommy, I want a snack. Can we cuddle? Um, You know, like help me with this thing, open this Lego thing or whatever it was. But I wasn't resentful. I wasn't angry at her for stopping because I knew that these were tasks that I can do one in 15 minutes or less, but two mentally I could do with her around. I cannot write a blog post. 
or a chapter in my book, or I can't do those things with my kids around because my attention is just too pulled and my brain's not focused. So setting yourself up for success in advance by knowing what those tasks are will allow you to capitalize on that time when you do have the chunks, but also give yourself the grace of trying to jam it all in. So that's kind of like a two-pronged approach using your time blocks, one, creating the themes around them, and two, proactively creating a list of things you know you can do when you have those times that need to get done and having it readily available so you're not wasting time figuring out what to do. So during, especially during the pandemic, this is kind of always a thing for parents with autistic kids, but especially since the pandemic, I feel like we're always kind of waiting for that call from the school. So even if we try to structure our day or even if there's like, all right, I've got six to eight hours to myself while they're in school, we're still kind of just, you know, just sitting by the cell phone waiting for that call that Mm -hmm. something needs addressed or we might need to drive in and bring in, you know, extra food or some sensory thing or maybe even just pick our kid up. So I'm wondering in those situations where kind of like we were talking about before, you just, you cannot predict your schedule. What can parents do when they know that at any point they could just suddenly be asked to drop everything and reschedule their day? Sure. And we touched on this already, but I wanted to add this one thing that has been really helpful for me because I I feel like we're all on on edge, right? Like we're all like waiting for the, literally anytime a message comes in from my kid's school, I'm like, oh no, (laughs) I'm like, oh no, what's happening, right? And so one of the proactive suggestions that I can give is to plan for it. So I talked a little bit about time blocking and I actually suggest that you make um, a couple blocks to plan for. One is like your goal block ideal. One is your in progress, which you're working on. And one I lovingly call when the poop hits the fan. And that is the block for when everything goes to heck. And you're like, I don't know what to do right now. What's your bare minimum? And so I actually recommend sitting down, making your like, you know, ideal schedule. I don't want to use perfect, but like ideal, like what would it look like? And then taking some stuff out so that during each time block, there's one thing you're like, okay, I know that typically during our morning routine block, I would like to unload the dishwasher, start a load of laundry and like, you know, do a read aloud with my kids. If I could only have one thing completed in that block, what would it be? And you could pull it out and it would be, okay, I would unload the dishwasher because if I unload the dishwasher, then all day I can just stick everything in the dishwasher. I don't have to worry about it. That's my one thing. And so if you do this in advance before it happens, again, not Debbie Downer, like we know what's going to happen. Let's be realistic about it. Preparing for that. And you pre-identify what those things are. Then when you have those days where your whole schedule gets turned upside down and you're like, well, what do I do? You can kind of pull this out. I literally have one printed out that I have created and be like, great, this is the new routine. And then I have just kind of the bare minimum. So I'm not, again, throwing my hands in the air, but instead I'm like, all right, this is what I'd like to accomplish today. And if I get this one thing done, I'm going to feel good. And then the other proactive thing that I've done is anytime teachers send stuff home for my kids or I come across something on Pinterest or like a cute activity, again, my small kids, they're four and almost six, my daughter's birthday is next week. Um, and my oldest, he's, he's very self-sufficient. So this is an example I use for my younger kids, but if the teacher sends like a pack at home or they email a link of something, or again, I see a resource, I save it. So I use Trello. I put it up on a Trello board, but I also will sometimes print them out and I keep them in a file folder. I did this a lot last year. This year I haven't printed much because we haven't had as much of a like urgent need. And I keep in my little cabinet worksheets, activities, craft ideas, stuff that's like already very easy, but done. So if I get the call that like my kid's class is quarantined and he has to be home and I have to, you know, entertain and hang with a four-year-old while trying to get work done, I not only have kind of my contingency block pre-made that I can say, great, okay, this is what we're going to work for today, but I have some stuff so I don't have to think because I find that when our brains are in crisis mode like that, um, and this is how I felt yesterday, like just full transparency, I was like, oh my gosh, we were, we were supposed to, inter- you know, do this interview yesterday. I had to keep my kid home. I was like, I can't figure out how to do all the work. Ah, like I didn't wrap my head around it. Now I had overnight to wrap my head around the fact that I was going to keep my daughter home another day. So I was able to like think clearly. But yesterday, because I felt panicky, I was like, okay, do we have anything in here? Now she's sick. So I didn't give her work to do, but say it was like a quarantine or whatever thing. I literally will just pull stuff out, like a lot of dot marker sheets, like things like that, that they can do that I know my son loves. You know, I have some bins of like kinetic sand stuff that I know that they can, that they do independently. And I'm not thinking in the moment because when we think in the moment like that, when we're not like being proactive about it and pre-planning, we just get reactive and we freak out and we're like, I don't know. I just, I, whatever we're going to do today. And I think that by keeping kind of, uh, you know, when the poop hits the fan, like block of day and 
session in like your office with a little bin of activities, when it happens, you can be like, okay, this is what we're going to do. You know, like I know we have one of those Osmo tablets. So I know like I, I'm going to give her her Osmo tablet when I have to get on calls. Like making all those plans when you're in a good mental state to make them is going to make it feel so much better when you're not in a good mental state because you're panicking because you have to move your whole day around and you're just going to feel like the world is collapsing on you. And so when you're in a good mood, when it's, things are going great, that's when you make a proactive plan to use just in case. Now there's a couple concepts in your book that, like you said, your time management book is unlike any other that I've ever seen before. A lot of it typically is that hustle culture and, you know, you have to be, it ties into ableism a little bit, but like this whole mm -hmm. idea that your value has to come from how hard you work and how much you produce. So in your book, you talk about a few concepts that I've just never heard of before. And so I'm really excited to get them out there in front of our listeners today. One of the first ones that you talk about is seasonal productivity. And this is one that I have not come across before. So I'm wondering if you can just explain a little bit about what it is and how it can kind of help parents as they build their schedules. Yeah, I love this. And this actually came to me from a place of burnout. <laughs> I was like, I'm go, go, go. I'm like Enneagram three, like go, go, go. Like let's do it type of a person. And I find myself getting in states of burnout very easily if I don't plan to relax a little bit. And things that happened in my business last year was I felt my team starting to feel like I can tell we were getting squirrely, right? We were just had too much going on, too many projects. And I said, we need a season where we take a break, but how do we do this on purpose? And so there's two components to seasonal productivity. One is realizing the actual season of life that you're in and making your goals make sense for that. So I give this example of my sister a lot. My sister, now he's almost one, but she had a baby in January. The type of things that my sister is worrying about in with a newborn are very different than what's important to me as somebody who has older kids, you know, who are out. Like, she's like, if I can get a shower, maybe nap for an hour, like we're, we're in successful, right? But instead what happens? We get this, we must perform or we're failing attitude from the world, um, which I, I like that you pointed that out. Like, yeah, it really is an ableist mentality. Like if you're not performing, you're not worthy. But instead, how about you back up and say like, what's my season? For example, we're recording this, it's holiday season. And I have my daughter's birthday, a million things happening. Like I, I the book coming out, like my stress level is high. And so I knew that this was going to be a busy season for me when it comes to work. And so this is a time where I'm giving myself more grace over eating out, right? We save a little bit more in the eating out budget for December because I knew that I wasn't going to be like making as many dinners because we're going to be on the go. I do the same thing in March when we have our big summit each year. I tell my husband, listen, it's summit season. So the stuff around the house isn't going to be looking as nice as normal. And I, you know, and I'm going to need more help. And so by first identifying what your season is, you can create a goal action plan that actually makes sense for you without shame, without guilt. And it's not about saying, I'm never going to achieve this goal or I'm not going to do it. But it's about saying, this doesn't make sense for me, my value, my priorities right now. I'm going to put it in a place that makes more sense. The second piece of season of productivity, though, is making sure it feels not so much balanced, but aligned so that you don't burn out. And again, I'm, I teach in the book a lot about proactive things and reactive things. So I give a lot of those strategies. This is a proactive approach to not burning out, and it's using this seasonal concept. So when you're thinking season, you could totally think like winter, summer, spring, fall. You could do it by quarter. You can do it by month. You could have a, a for your week, whatever you want it to be. And one of the things I like to tell people is like, don't feel like because the calendar says it's Monday the first, you have to have everything together on a Monday, like the calendar's calendar. So I teach a quarterly goal process. Your quarter is your quarter. It doesn't have to start perfectly because what happens is, right, we miss it. We're like, I don't have my action plan together for January. I must wait till the next quarter. Like, ah, but don't, don't do that. Just start the next week, right? So that was just a little like, don't worry about the calendar type of thing. But when you're thinking about your season, I want to encourage you to put in four different things. Either first look at your year, then maybe look at your quarter and then your month, but have a season of push, which, you know, could be the word hustle, but I don't like it. We're going to use push. So that's a season like right now where I'm getting everything ready for the book. I'm in like a season of push. I also recommend that you have a season of planning. One of the things that I don't notice that a lot of people are doing is actually scheduling time for planning. And so in my quarterly goal system, I actually encourage you to get off the quarter, the actual calendar and take a week 13 where that's your planning. week. And in week 13, like you're going to spend the time preparing for it. So a season of planning 
a season of rest and relaxation, because if we don't put it in our calendars, it is not going to happen. And a season of fun, because I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot of fun. Like I told my husband, I was like, I'm really happy. Like life's good, but I don't have a lot of actual fun if I don't plan it out. It's just not in my nature. Like it's it's weird to say, but I have to plan, have fun sometimes, or it's not going to happen. And so when you have looked at your season of life that you're in, and then you look at these four things that I want to suggest you add into your, your time. And you just pick a time frame. So maybe this is each month. You look at your month and you say, in my month, I want to have a season, which could be a week, right? If we're doing four simple math, like four things divided by four weeks. One of my weeks is going to be a season of planning. I need to plan something out for the holidays. I need to plan out this work project. So maybe week one of the month is my season of plan. And I just know that if I can get through this season of plan, I can move to the next season. Well, then maybe I move into my season of push where I'm like doing and getting all the things done, doing all my holiday shopping, my wrapping, and I do it all in one week. I batch that out. And then I have the next week. I'm like, okay, so after I get through that, that's going to be my season of rest where I'm not going to feel guilty if I'm not going all the time. But instead, this is where I'm going to relax. Now, could you do things? Yeah, you don't just sit on the couch all the time. But having that mindset is really helpful. And then you're like, all right, now I'm going to have my season of fun where I can still do a whole bunch of things, but I'm going to make sure I add some stuff that's just really enjoyable for me. And I find that by looking proactively at my schedule this way, I know when I'm going to be productive. And this used to help me when I was working. I used to work at a Barnes and Noble. And like I said, I was working every day. I was growing my business. My husband would come home from work at 545. I would leave to get to the mall at six to go work. I would work six to 10 multiple nights a week, Saturdays and Sundays. And I was exhausted. And so I knew that I always closed on Saturday nights. I never worked Saturday mornings. And so for me, it was like, if I can just get through my week, then I'm going to take a nap on Saturday before work and it's going to be great. And so mentally just knowing I had Saturday nap coming was wonderful. It's the exact same concept. But if you don't plan out the fun, if you don't plan out the rest, if you don't plan out to plan, all you're going to do is push, 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 push burnout, burnout, burnout. And then mom's yelling about, you know, one tiny piece of paper on the floor and blowing up over nothing. And it's not, it's not about the paper. It's about the fact that your cup is overflowing because you didn't put in anything for, for you. And you didn't kind of align your seasons with your life. I like that. I like that. Cause I think that's what I'm doing right now. Like something small. And I feel like I'm dressing over that piece of paper, you know? Mm-hmm. No, for sure. And I I love how you talk about the planning aspect too, because I feel like sometimes we just get so overwhelmed and it feels like we don't have, if we don't take that time to kind of plan out those things, it can feel hard to like justify them for ourselves. You know, I have so much to do. I have to get it done. And if I don't get it done, I have to just keep going till I do. And like you say, that's a really, that's a really great recipe for burnout. I love the idea of being proactive and just kind of planning those things in for yourself to kind of prevent it. Now, you also talk in the book about setting quarterly goals rather than annual goals. And this was a concept that, again, was super interesting to me. And you also talk about three specific main types of goals. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that and, again, just how it can help parents. I used to do the same with the annual goals. I thought, oh, it's January 1st. I got to make a vision board. I got to do the thing. And I realized what was happening. I was making these great goals in January and maybe, maybe you've been there if you're listening, you're like, oh, I know this, right? You make the goals and then life happens. And then by February, you're like, what goals? I'll try again next year, <laughs> right? And that's it. That's the formula, rinse and repeat. And this quarterly process um, came to me. I read a, a book. There's a really good book called The 12 Week Year by Brian P. Moran. And in it, he said, when you have a quarterly system, you're not waiting for the end of the year. And this light bulb went off and I was like, that's what I'm doing. I'm just like waiting until the end of the year. And so I would do either one of two things. I would, you know, just drop my goal because I forgot about it, or I would get so behind that I would quit because it was overwhelming, or I would be like, oh yeah, I said I was going to read 52 books this year, but it's October and I've read three. So, you know, now I have, you know, 51 books left to go, 49 books left to go, What am I, you know, and, and you just get overwhelmed and you quit. Instead of doing that, I do, re- and I do recommend annual goals, but I recommend you take your annual goals. I call them numerical. Typically those are numerical ones. And you break them down for your quarter. Again, I had mentioned the calendar. Don't worry about actual quarter of the year. Whenever you're listening to this, your quarter can start whenever. And you take one week of planning and you do it in 15 minute chunks. Put on a timer, put on a podcast, put on some songs, whatever you want to do. Take 15 minutes a day for five days and plan out the quarter. And that becomes what's called week 13, right? That like after your 12 weeks, you take a week to plan the next quarter and then you start to implement. And in this, you're doing this amazing thing where you're giving yourself focus, but you're giving yourself self-created urgency. And it's one of the reasons why in sales, like most of the sales come in the final quarter of the year, because they're like, oh, we got to meet our 
a quota. Instead of saying, I'm going to wait to the end of the year, you say, what do I want to accomplish by the end of this 12 week period? By the, and I'm going to say quarter, but y'all know, I mean, whatever your 12 week quarter is, right? So what do I want to accomplish by the end of this quarter? So if we use this numerical example of the books, right? So I would do just some simple math to figure out how to break a numerical goal down. If my big annual goal is 52 books for the year, maybe that's what I wanted to do, but that's a lot. Let's do 24. Let's be real. <laughs> so my goal is 24 books for the year. I know that in my year, again, not calendar, but mine, there are four 12 week periods, right? There's four goals. So I'm going to just do some math. 24 and then divide that up by four. That gives me six books. Okay. Six books is a little less scary. It's a little less overwhelming. It's still kind of a lot, but can I do it? Well, let's go a step further. In this first 12 week period, I know I want to do six books. I'm going to divide that up by the months. All right. So six divided by three, two books a month. All right. Well, maybe I haven't read in a while and two books a month sounds really overwhelming to me. I want you to take a step further. And in this numerical process, you're going to say, all right, so if I know I want to hit these six books in this quarter, which again is going to keep you on track, and I know I need two books for this first month, I want you to say, how are you going to read? What's your reading plan? I do a parallel. So I'm always reading four, like four books at one time, but maybe you want to do one book at a time and then say, all right, how many pages is that a day? And when you divide it up, you're going to get something around 15 minutes. Look at that. See how that worked out, right? If you do it for 15 minutes, five times during that week, you're going to make progress on your goals. And what's great about this is it kind of keeps you in check and in line for those big annual goals. So you make themes for your quarters and you're like, this is my big theme. This is what I want to accomplish based on my season. You work towards those. And then at the end of the quarter, you kind of do a look back, right? So like if we make a nice analogy to like an IEP, right? These are like the quarterly progress monitoring towards your big IEP goal you make adjustments and amendments. So you're like, all right, I said I was going to read six books in this quarter, but I, I was able to get two done. So how do I readjust my goal? And so at the second quarter, you just redo the math and then you're like, all right, so now instead of two books a month, I have to read 2.5. And in you, what you didn't do though, was you didn't wait to quarter four to do your readjustment, realize you have to read all the books or you're done. You're slowly making those. So if we think about it with financial goals, right? You know, you want to save thousand dollars a month or something. I like say you want to save thousand dollars and you can break it down how much you need to do a week. If you're constantly adjusting your quarterly goals. And I teach a concept of like monthly and quarterly reflecting on stuff by readjusting your numbers in small chunks you're more likely to stay on track than if you just said, this is my big goal for the year. I'll check in with it every once in a while, right? It allows you to have a more strategic plan and allows you to do kind of an audit around that goal to not get behind. So I love the quarterly system because you're just looking at annually. It's just so far in advance, right? There's no urgency there. You And what you, I don't know about you, but what I do is I'll be like, oh, I'll catch up later, right? Like um, I'll be like, oh, I want to lose some weight this year. And then I'll be like, okay, 30 30 pounds. That's great. That's like half a pound a week or something. It's so, that's so manageable in my head. But if I'm not checking in with it, if I'm not focusing, if I'm not tweaking it, as I go through the quarter, I get to quarter four in December and I'm like, oh, I got to lose 30 pounds in December. Huh? All right. <laughs> like that's not going to work. And we quit on it. And so a quarterly system allows you to focus on a few things at a time, focus on them in smaller increments, but also stay on track for your bigger goals. Cause it's all kind of like this, you know, beautiful, big picture and connection. Awesome. Awesome. That sounds like a really great strategy. And now a word from our sponsor. Let's talk elopement. And no, it's not just running away to Vegas to get married. Wandering, also called elopement, is an important safety issue that affects some people with disabilities, their families, and the community. Nearly 50% of individuals with autism spectrum disorder have attempted to or have successfully eloped from a known adult. As a parent, nothing scarier than finding your child wandering in or alone outside when you thought they were safe in bed. Maybe you can't travel because you can't leave that sleeping setup you rigged up at home, leaving you feeling like you can never go on a vacation or take a trip as a family. Above all, you're probably exhausted from missing sleep. Let us introduce you to the Safety Sleeper, an enclosed and portable sleeping system. Designed by Rose Morris, a mom with a child on the spectrum, the Safety Sleeper is the most versatile bed system on the market. It's durable enough for everyday use and smartly designed to be portable for travel. You can buy the Safety Sleeper direct through Medicaid or your private health insurer. Plus, our friends at Safety Sleeper have put together a free trial giveaway exclusively for Mom Autism Money listeners. Learn more at safetysleeper.com backslash M-A-M. That's short for mom autism money. 
Again, that's going to be safetysleeper.com backslash M-A-M. And we've talked a little bit about time blocking already, but in the book, I noticed that you break it down into kind of like three specific types of time blocks. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that and how you came to a place where you realized like, okay, these are the, like the three main types that are most effective for planning and actually getting stuff done. So there's three blocks that I really suggest you make because a lot, a lot of people, when I tell them about time blocking, they get stuck in every day has to be the same, all right? Like my Monday through Friday has to be the same. And I'm going to tell you, it doesn't. It, it, who says it has to? Your Monday, and I think this is one of the things with like the homeschool cyber schooling thing is that they have different schedules, right? So A, B schedules, Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedules, like all those things are different. And so first up is you can have a Monday, Friday time block. You can have a weekend time block. Um, one of the things I know some of the moms that work with me is they'll be like, well, my, my husband travels for work and it's home. I feel like everything is, you know, up in the air or it's different or it's changed. So I said, why don't you make a time block for when he's home? And, and you pull that one out. So one is customize them. But the three that I recommend are that progress, ideal, and the when the poop hits the fan. So start with your ideal block. All right. Go through the time blocking. Um, I know we touched on it very, very briefly before, but map out your blocks, your themes. What does it look like for you ideal? This is where you dream. This is where it's like pie in the sky. If I could have a almost perfect day, what would each of my blocks look like? Now you've got a vision. I teach a five-step process. And step one is always creating your vision. If you don't know where you want to go, you cannot create a plan. So start with where do we want to go? What's my vision? What are all the things I'd like to fit in my blocks? Make this ideal block so that When you're making your action plan, you can adjust accordingly. If you have a day where you are like, hey, I finished my 15 minute task towards my goal. You know what comes next. Like you have the plan of where you want to go. And this is the cool thing about like my routine and habit stacking is like, this is exactly what it is. It's like these tiny chunks where you're like, hey, I know that in my evening routine this week, I was working on loading the dishes and next week I'm supposed to work on wiping the counters down before we go to bed. And I loaded the dishes and it didn't take very long. Um, So I feel like wiping the counters down. I'm going to do that. But it's not the pressure of having to do it, right? So having your ideal block is important because you know your vision. The next thing you're going to do is going to be your in-progress block. And so there's a couple of things I want you to do. One is we're going to do a nice little baseline for it. So again, we can make our goals. If you're like, this sounds really familiar. A lot of it came from writing IEPs and progress monitoring. Like I was like, we need our data for FBA. Like where are we at? How long do these things take you now? I know that it takes me six minutes to unload my dishwasher, but I will complain about it for like 20 minutes. So knowing that time will allow you then to map your times appropriately. So I recommend going through when you're creating your in-progress blocks, starting with the time inventory, tracking how long things take, and then slow and steady, use my routine and my habit stacking concept to grow it. So you might make these beautiful ideal blocks and you're like, these are my five blocks in the day. This is what I want to accomplish. And what we do is we say, I'm going to do it all. Right. And this is that Monday mentality where you're like, I'm going to go to diet and go to the gym for two hours a day and never look at chocolate or sniff a curb or something. And then by Wednesday, you're like, yeah, I'm going to do that again. And we'll try on Monday. Why do we feel the need to do it all? This pressure to just show up fast, slow up a bit. Let's slow down your progress and grow your confidence and the progress. So what I want to encourage you to do is use routine and habit stacking. Look at your time block. So say, for example, let's do that evening routine when I talked about my ideal evening routine, I would do, we'll do four things just for the sake of easy math here. I'm going to load the dishwasher. I'm going to make the meals for tomorrow. I'm going to wipe down the counters and I'm going to sweep the floor. That's like my ideal pickup evening routine. I know that's where I want to go. Now I've done my time inventory. So I know how long each of those things take. And I know that they're all 15 minute or less tasks. So in my ideal block, Instead of starting with all four, you're going to pick one. And during the first week, because we said four things, again, math, four things divided up four weeks, you know, and you can have them take as, you can customize as little as long as you want. Week one, I'm just going to worry about the unloading, the loading of the dishwasher. That's it. I know where I want to go, but my in-progress block, all I'm going to track is like, did I load my dishwasher five times this week? It'll take me six minutes. I have one thing. I'm not overwhelming myself with doing everything. At the end of the week, you do what I call track and stack. I talk about all this in the book, but you figure out, you do some math. Is it time to add another habit? If it is, you're like, all right, I'm now going to stack. So now I'm going to, what did I say? Make lunch for tomorrow. All right. So now I have two things I'm working on in my in progress. So your in progress block is fluid. It is always and constantly moving. So I'm going to be 
loading up the dishes and making the lunches. Now, if I feel like doing one of the other things, I will. If I don't, I won't. Move to week three, you add the third thing. Move to week four, you add the fourth thing. And you know, you can add, I don't recommend any more than eight things. It's just too many in one time block. I think three to five is a magic number here. So you're constantly changing up your in-progress block. And then again, you make your, when the poop hits the fan. So now again, you know your ideal, you know what you're working on and you pick the one thing for each each of your blocks that, you know, that you're going to focus on when, you know, stuff goes crazy. And in this way, you have this contingency plan, you have a progress plan, you have a vision, and you're not trying to put everything on your plate at once. A lot of times as parents, I feel like especially as moms, we tend to put ourselves last. This is something that I was personally working on and doing a lot better with prior to the pandemic. And I noticed that I don't know that I ever put myself first, but when I didn't at least put myself last on my list of priorities, when I started prioritizing like, okay, Bryn, you need to take care of yourself too. You need to go out and have fun. You need to see your friends. You need, you know, you need time alone and it's okay to not always be mom. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. I noticed that my life was going a lot better. And also that kind of counterintuitively, I became a better mom throughout that process because I was taking care of myself. I don't know that I've done as well at that throughout the pandemic, to be honest with you. So I'm, I'm wondering, how do you go about encouraging moms to kind of change that inner narrative and better prioritize their own needs and goals? Yeah. I mean, it's real. We hit burnout, this burnout cycle very fast when we're not taking care of ourselves. And I think that there's like a long game and a short game. The thing about this belief system where we feel the mom guilt and we become a martyr and all this happens is, is like, this is ingrained. Like we have been taught this from something in our life, TV, people we've seen, books, Instagram. Like we have been taught that mothers are supposed to be selfless, do everything for everyone else and put themselves last. And I really want to change that narrative because when we're just living for everyone else, we lose ourselves along the way. We absolutely become this like shell of a person because we've forgotten what brings us joy and we don't put our own goals on our plate. You know, it's exactly everything we've been talking about today. By starting to change the narrative, we can start to change that that long game. I'm not going to get too like sciencey, but there there is like this these neural pathways in our brain that have these belief systems. Like I was talking about Julia, my inner critic. Like she's there telling me that I'm a loser who's never going to accomplish something because that's something I heard as a kid, or that's something that I heard at work, or that you know what I mean. Like, but if you start to transform the way you speak to yourself and you start to change that narrative you actually can change in your brain that belief system to become a person that feels positively about yourself. And I I am a testament of this. Like I had mentioned, like I was someone who was suffering with depression. I had had um, two times in my life where I thought about ending it. Like I was, I was done and I was a negative, nasty, not nice person. I tell people that and they're like, yeah, they don't believe me, but I was not in a good mental state. And I've had to work really hard. And it's, listen, it's not there every day. Like I literally struggled with this on Sunday where I was like, you're the worst mom ever. You know, like we did that thing, but I'm able to bounce back a lot easier now. And it's possible to change that voice. There's the long game. One is, I think a lot of people don't even think it's possible. A lot of people think this is my life. This is, I'm I'm stuck. Like, let's be real. Like, let's talk. Like, I don't know. Like, this is how it's always going to be for me when my kids go away, uh, I don't know, college or what, you know, whatever. And especially, um, you know, depending on the, the amount of care they need, right? Um, if you have kids who have disabilities and, and you're trying to figure out, like, are you their primary caregiver for their whole life? Like, there's a lot of mental, like, does this end for me? And I find that a lot of the moms that come to me, they come to me in two camps. I have a lot of moms who are moms of younger kids who are realizing they're losing themselves in motherhood and they they know they need to change it. And the other big group I have is moms of high school kids, empty nesters, and grandmas who have lost themselves and are like, oh my God, my kids are gone. I don't know. I don't know who I am anymore. And they come to me because they're like, help me find the time. And so one is we got to talk about the long game, but two is in the short term by showing up for yourselves. And that's again, magic of the 15 minutes by showing up for yourselves in these 15 minute chunks, you're going to grow that confidence back that you're worth the time. Now, listen, you are worth more than 15 minutes a day, but I know some days it doesn't feel like it. So can you show up for yourself? for one goal for 15 minutes? Can you go walk on your treadmill for 15 minutes, do that one thing for you? Or can you go hide in the bathroom and read a book for 15? Like, can you do that for yourself and prove to yourself, to that inner critic, that you're worth that time? Once you start doing that consistently over time, 
you will change your belief system. Your brain will start to realize I'm worth this. And you will start to alleviate the nasty voice and that negative pattern and the guilt that comes from taking time for yourself. And then the other encouragement, you know, that I can give moms out there is you deserve it. You deserve to have fun. You deserve to hang out with your friends if you want to. And I know that for a lot of us, we're primary caregiver maybe, or you don't have as much support. Like my husband works really long hours. So a lot of the kid stuff falls on me. So it's very different for everyone, but I want to encourage you to reach out to find a support system to help. You can also like take that break. Like I have book club tonight, right? Um, and it's something I started doing with friends and it's so exciting to go away for two, two hours to somebody's house, and, like have a glass of wine and just like hang out with other people and like not talk about our, our kids and remember who Kara is again. And I think that when you start to lose yourself, you need to find something that has nothing to do with your kids pick up a hobby. A lot of the moms in the club will be doing hobbies. They inspire me. Like they're learning languages and they're knitting and they're scrapbooking and taking photography classes. And they say a lot of it is because of the encouragement to spend 15 minutes a day learning. That goes back to that planning, right? That that planning system. I said 15 minutes a day of learning something, start to spark that inside you again. I think you'll start to see that confidence build that you're worth it. I, this right here, like, I think it's also a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know, me being Puerto Rican and Hispanic, that moms that we have to put ourselves last so kids first family first and then so i i need that space to mentally i don't know to mentally prepare to just relax and not talk about kids and i so agree with you on this one i personally do it and i know that 2022 is the year where joyce will be going on vacation yes (laughs) no absolutely i hope vacation comes back in 2022 i want that so bad (laughs) We've talked a little bit too about just the whole rest aspect and this is kind of a struggle I have and maybe it's because I just I think very black and whitely and I probably do need to change some of my inner narratives around some of this stuff and my own expectations for myself but sometimes I feel like I want to stop judging myself when I'm not super productive. But at the same time, I look at all of the things that are very real that I need to get done like I have to file my uh, Medicaid recertification for my kid here coming up in the next couple of weeks. I also have to finalize my ACA plan. I also have to get this presentation done for my kid's school. I'm doing like a presentation for the students or whatever. And so I'm trying not to judge myself, but at the same time, there's a very real list of like deadlines and stuff I need to get done in front of me. And so I'm wondering if you have any tips for just kind of balancing like we don't we don't want to completely let go and just say like oh I'm not going to judge myself so therefore you know all these things I'm just going to ignore right because we can't do that in real life unfortunately but we also don't want to stress ourselves out so badly that we just like you're saying we don't want to burn ourselves out and render ourselves incapable I'm wondering if you have any tips on like helping moms kind of find that very fine line between those two things. And again, like you said, not necessarily balancing things, because I don't think balance is an achievable goal, but maybe finding that alignment between the two. Yeah, for real. It is It is a struggle and a challenge, but it's not something that isn't achievable. Um, there's this like Nora Roberts quote going around or something she said, I don't know if you've heard it, but it's about the rubber and the glass balls. And this is one of the ways I look at things when it comes to priorities is that some of our priorities and the things that we need to get done based on our season. So going back to seasonal productivity, they're glass balls, right? Like pretending we're juggling all the things, right? If they dropped, they would fall. Now, some of them are still important, but they're rubber balls, which means if they drop, they're going to bounce back. And so when you look at your seasons, I think it's identifying which of those things are rubber and glass. And Sometimes for me, when it's a heavy work season, some of the family stuff, it's still important. I still have to balance it, but it becomes a rubber ball for me, right? So like in this season of busy with the book, like today was spirit day for my son's school. I forgot his shirt. We're late on his homework assignment. You know, he's in school, whatever. His random school stuff for the holidays, like it's important, but it's a rubber ball right now. I'm not going to beat myself up with the fact that I, I like walked in and I was like, Ooh, spirit day, right? Like I'm not going to be, I said it. And the teacher was like, it's okay. I'm like, I know it's okay. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to beat myself up over it. I wish I had remembered it, but again, it's still important to me, but it's not a glass ball. If it falls during this season, it falls during the season. It'll bounce back up. 
Okay. So I think it's identifying those rubber and glass balls for yourself, but also creating what I like to call a priority to-do list instead of just a to-do list. I think a lot of times what happens is we'll do these great brain dumps and then we have 900 things on a list and you're like, uh, where do we start here? And so one of the things I like to do is categorize out and I I teach a priority like quadrant dump that's very similar to like Eisenhower matrix if you've heard of that, but this is a very like quick and easy way to do it. Break your paper up into all your roles. So you might have work, you have mom, have school, um, like stuff for the kids school, you have holidays, whatever your roles or tasks or categories are. Brain dump your list in categories first, not just on a big piece of paper, because that's overwhelming. And then I want to encourage you to go through and rank them in order. So you kind of have an idea of where to start. Then one of the things you can do is kind of drop them in this quadrant that I, I teach. And it really is about urgency. So you kind of know what fits where and you take stuff off your paper really can get done next week. So with my daughter home today, I have things that have to get done today. The deadline is today. I'm not worrying about the stuff that I can do that's due Friday because I have more urgent things. So I think it's a mix of one, mastering how you manage your to-do list in your season, but then also talking about the rest, going ahead and planning that season of rest out that we talked about earlier in the episode. Your season can be a week, right? So do you have one day of the week that's your rest day? And then knowing that listen, I just got to get through Monday through Friday, Saturday is my rest day, right? Like I know I have at least one day of that. And by again, proactively doing that, then you don't need to always do the reactive to-do list, like I mentioned, but you've got a good plan from both ends. And I just think it's so key that we balance that. Yes, we have things that we have to get done, stuff that can't fall off of our plate, paperwork that has to get filled out. But if you can do your best to maybe inside your time blocks, can you create a block to complete all those things? So one of the things that I add into a time block is called thought catcher time. And it's literally all the things I forget that I have to do. And it's two 30 minute blocks during my week where I don't plan anything out. And what happens during those, those chunks, it's really meta. It's like a block inside a block, but what happens during that 30 minute block is that I go do the things I forgot run all my errands. I fill out my paperwork, like all, all the stuff I have to get done. I assign, I know it's going to pop up, So I proactively give myself that time. And I want you to also proactively give yourself a rest space. Even if it's just half a day, a quick little nap, you know, one hour, me and my husband have worked so that Saturdays he gets to sleep in. And on Sundays I get to sleep in a little bit and sleep. My son is up at five. So sleeping in for us is just anything past seven. I would really like, right. So we, we pre-identified that. So I know that it's coming. So I'm just like, if I can make it to Sunday morning, I can sleep till seven and not get up at five. Like, hello, let's do this. And so I think it's about looking at your season, planning out the rest. If you can creating priorities on your to-do list that are actually urgent, right? Those glass balls, not the rubber balls. And then making sure you've got the rest kind of tied in. It's like this thing we can put up in a little bow. And if we follow the system, then we can maybe ditch the guilt a little bit because we know other things will plop in where they fit. I have myself muted while you're speaking, but I am giggling like the entire time because I'm like, oh my God, she knows me. (laughs) (laughs) This is just very, very real. I love that analogy of the glass ball and the rubber ball too. That's a really, I feel like that's going to be a really helpful way to think about it. I found that social media influencers us moms we want to do it all because we are portrayed to have everything done in 24 hours if we buy the planner that they're using or the app that they're using because that's what makes you feel like uh, the super mom the good mom Mm -hmm. which you know really annoys me but what do you what do you say because I if to me, I feel like I get emails like that. It's to stop following influencers yeah. because no, we all have, the, like you said, we all have the same 24 hours and they probably have the nanny. But what, what do you suggest? I mean, I think that ma- we are comparing ourselves to this fakeness that's out there in social media more now since we're home and pandemic. And I'm seeing this uprise of you know, well, you can do what I do if you buy this or that. So what, what do you suggest? What, what, I need to hear your opinion about this. this yeah, I can, I can talk about this one for a while. Well, one, I'm going to tell you something. The planner is not going to fix your life. And as somebody who has a planner graveyard in my office and who went through a phase of just trying to buy every planner to find the one that was going to work for me because it worked for somebody else, it's not about the planner. It's about the plan you customize for you. The system I teach is called SOAR. I could teach it to anybody and they could use any planner and it would work. It's not the planner. Now, 
do I like a good plan? Uh, yeah. Do I love like writing my weekly plan out in there? Yes. But it doesn't, that's not it. You could do it on a piece of paper and it's fine. I think a lot of times we as moms think this mom looks like they have it all together. So if I just copy what they do, I will have it all together. And we forget that we're not them. And that's okay. Like we're not meant to be them. Like I believe like we're divinely created to like be us in our own messiness and our own strengths and our own struggles. And can you learn from other people? I completely think so, right? Like people who have been there who can share their tip. But I believe it's when we make this idol out of, of people on social media that they have to be perfect all the time and they have these perfect lives that we start to feel like we aren't measuring up. And a friend of mine said to me once, she was like, you know, I find that if I'm following someone and I'm scrolling their feed for more than like five minutes, I'm either comparing myself to them or I'm judging them. And that means I need to unfollow. And I've always remembered that. And that's something that I find is like, I have to unfollow them. Now I remember their names. I can still type their name in Instagram. Well, don't pretend like you're going to forget who it is, but by not having that constant thing in your face, making you feel inadequate, I think you can start changing your mindset around it. And also just the reminder that people share their highlight reels. It is rare. And this is one of the things like I like to share a lot of struggles that I have. And I, you know, somebody DM me and they were like, you know, I bet if you, if I, so I struggled to clean, cleaning, cleaning routines are hard for me. I never learned how to look properly adults when I was a kid. And so I shared this and I was sharing how I was struggling to clean and my house was messy. And someone said, DM me. And they're like, if you're supposed to be teaching people how to manage their, this is how I imagine they sound, but <laughs> to manage their time. Don't you think you would probably have more clients if like yours was more together? Like I wouldn't buy something from you because your house was a mess. And I was like, I'm not teaching cleaning routine. Like if I was teaching cleaning, yeah, yeah, sure. I would expect like a more clean house, but I ain't. So let's release this expectation like that you have to show up perfectly. But I think there is a lot of pressure to show up perfectly, to only show the good stuff, to show the highlight reel. And like, I almost didn't share today on my Insta stories that I forgot about my son's spirit day and the ornament that he was supposed to, be. like, I almost didn't share it because I was in my head. I was like, oh my God, I'm supposed to be the time management person. And, and I, I they're going to be able to, they're going to think I'm a fake and a fraud, like all that story that I tell myself, but I was sharing my stories and I mentioned it in that I was like, oh, I forgot the spirit day and it happens. And I think that by being our authentic selves and being more vulnerable about that, we allow other people to like, feel like it's okay to be normal human beings. And I just want to encourage you, if you find yourself like feeling sad or down, or I can't look like them or their house. And this happens to me a lot. Like, uh, like I'm not good at decorating. So I'll look at other people's houses that look really nice. And I'm like, oh, my house is trash. Like when I find Julia, my inner critic, when she starts to come back up, I already know she's there. And I'll be like, and I know this sounds silly, but I really do talk to myself like this. Like I probably walk around my house, myself, like the house talking to myself all day like this. I believe Julia, we're not doing this today. Your house is the way your house is because it's your house, not theirs. And I have all these weird phrases that I tell myself because I know that I know it's a, it's a belief system that we're trying to disrupt. And when you create pattern disruptors like that, like I have a noise, <laughs> I don't know why I'm sharing this. I have a noise. I tell myself when I start to see it and a lot of my club members will hear it when we're on lives. If I start to use the word should, which is we have a phrase, stop shooting on yourself because it's just one of those limiting belief ones. But when I find myself starting to say things like I'm off, um, I'm behind, it's not a phrase that I like to use. I'll say like off track. But when I find myself being like, Oh, I got so behind this week, da, 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 I'll make like this weird noise. I'm like, <laughs> and it's like a clicking noise. And then I will um, literally interrupt the pattern to stop myself from doing it. And that allows me to pause and be mindful and be like, because if not, we would just run our mouths and talk negatively about ourselves all day because we're not stopping it. And that helps me stop the pattern to realize Julia's rearing her ugly head and identifying what the truth truth is in the situation. So this is a, everything I feel like we talked about today. We skimmed the surface. Like there's so deep we can go on this, but to sum that up, just stop following the people that don't make you feel good realize that they're just showing their highlight reels, find more people that are showing their authentic selves and share your own authentic truths to encourage others. And then also start to recognize when those comparisons are happening so that you can start to see your patterns and then create a plan around changing. Now we are so excited for this book to come out. I am wondering when does it come out? And this is, I think this is going to air a little bit before it's officially available mm -hmm. to the public. So I'm kind of wondering if you might have a wait list or something where people could sign up now while they're thinking about it so that they can make sure that they get their hands on it when it is published. 
Yeah, I think this is going to come out about a, a couple weeks beforehand. So the book's called The 15 Minute Formula, How Busy Moms Can Ditch the Guilt, Say Yes to What Matters, and Conquer Their Goals. It'll be on Amazon. We're very close to getting it in Barnes and Noble, but you can get it there. If you go to a, the 15minuteformula.com slash waitlist, I'll have that page up and ready soon where you can get on the waitlist to be notified. We're not doing a pre-order. Um, the book comes out January 23rd. So you, it's right around that time where um, <laughs> moms have made all their goals and they're starting to fade <laughs> like that third week in January, you know, I was like, this will be their boost. And so January 23rd, you can get the book on hardcover, paperback, um, or e Kindle version on Amazon. So it's the 15 minute formula.com slash waitlist. And that will send you to sign up. We'll email you when the book comes out. Um, and if you do it early enough, you might even get the opportunity to be part of the launch team. So you would be able to get the book earlier than that. So but if you want to connect with me in the meantime, um, what you can do is one Instagram is my fave. So head over there. I'm over at a purpose driven mom. I have a podcast, uh, the purpose driven mom show, and you can come jump into the purpose driven mom club. And that's our monthly membership where we have coaching and an action plan, and you can get access to my SOAR formula to help you create priority based goals. It's over at a purpose driven mom.com slash goals. There's a free class you can watch and it'll link you over to the club. That was so awesome. I'm so glad that Kara joined us today. Now, guys, you want to make sure to pick up this book. It comes out on January 23rd, 2022. But if you go to the link in the show notes, you'll be able to sign up for the waitlist. Uh, people on the waitlist, you'll get an email updating you whenever the book does go live and you can purchase it. And also by signing up for the waitlist, you might even be able to join the launch team for Kara's book and kind of get access to it a little bit earlier. So highly encourage everyone to go check that out today. Joyce, what were some of your favorite tips from Kara when it came to that time management stuff? I'm going to make a disclaimer here. Kara and I are friends. We met through starting our businesses together in the same um, So I am very proud of her accomplishment. But what I like about Kara is that I am different. And she knows that I work completely different. I don't follow trends. I follow Joyce's trends. And she does this in this book. Like, it's not what an uh, influencer will say or wake up early. It's, it's my time my way of doing things to get things done. And I think this is so important because we all seem to want to copy the same thing over and over again. And not everything is the same. As parents, especially kids, we should know that we don't can follow trends and we can't do what other people do. We got to do what works for our family. And I, this is what I enjoy about the whole entire recording when she was talking. I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. Loved it. How about you? Which one was your favorite? No, definitely. That, that was exactly it. I felt like a lot of the time management plans that you read or the tips you read, they assume a very specific type of lifestyle and it just doesn't work for me. So I was really glad to hear Kara talk about all of it, especially like how she talked about building in like the poop hits the fan blocks. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I need that because every day I don't know what's going to pop up and just kind of derail everything. So that was really, really smart to just kind of like build that in without stopping your progress or getting discouraged. Because I feel like that's what happens a lot for me when I get derailed. I'm just like, oh, you know, I'm not going to get everything done. I just can't do it anymore. Um, but by building it in, I think that's really going to help me just kind of better manage my time and be, <laughs> be more effective after these past two years. Thank you guys so much for listening. We will see you here next week on Tuesday for our final episode of this season. Now, while you're here, whether you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever, it super helps us out if you could just hit that subscribe button real quick. Also, if you want to check out our website, momautismmoney.com, that's also another great way to connect. All right, we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.